Hey everyone, Malio here. In my last video, I... Oh my god, it's been a year since I uploaded. Let me explain. So I've been focused on two main things over the past year, the first of which is Kanoko, which is a re-implementation of Mario Kart Wii's physics engine in C++. Basically, we can use a program called Ghidra to analyze the game's assembly code, turn it into readable C++ code, clean it up a little bit, and then run it independently from the game. What this means is we can take a time trial ghost file and chuck it into this bad boy, and it can simulate the entire race in just a fraction of a second. I'll have another video probably a year from now, if I keep up with this pace, that goes into more detail and explains some possible use cases for Kanoko. It's been a lot of fun to work with Vibold and a few other people in the community to constantly improve this and build it out over the past year. I'm excited to continue working on it and feel free to follow along with our progress. We have a GitHub repository and a Discord server you could join. Uh, I'll have links for both of those in the description, so feel free to check it out. Now the other project, which will be the focus of this video, I actually finished over a year ago. In my last video, I talked about how CPGP, the custom track distribution pack with its own time trials and leaderboards, has some additional software security patches to prevent cheating in time trials and online play. Continuing the theme of me trying to be a menace, how else can I circumvent cheat detection? Because if we know CTGP has good security patches against software changes, I can't really go that route. What if I made a custom controller? You know, have it behave just like a regular GameCube controller so the Wii thinks that it's real, but in reality it's taking inputs from a pre-existing time trial ghost file and sending it down the wire to the console as if it were a real controller. Man, I can't even begin to imagine how complicated that would be. Right? It's like really easy. Like, I don't understand how I got this to work so easily. It should not have been this easy. Why was it this easy? This is concerning! So this is a replay device tailored for Mario Kart Wii that takes inputs from a time trial ghost file stored on this little guy, sends it down a GameCube cable plugged into an unmodified Wii, and plays back the inputs on console with a 100% success rate. I am not a hardware guy. I've never even soldered before this project. That being said, I'm concerned that it took me less than a week to get this all working. So if I was able to do it this easily, there is nothing stopping a bad actor from submitting inauthentic runs to the leaderboards and keeping their mouth shut. If you already have the equipment to make these and you sold them to people, you could probably break even by only charging 20 US dollars per replay device, which is a pretty low cost barrier. Not to mention, uh, the software that I wrote for this was a lot more straightforward than I expected. That is to say, the whole point of this video is to inform the community that something like this was inevitable, that it's really easy to make, and they need to take appropriate action. I want to stress the importance of responsible disclosure, which is the idea that before you go public about some kind of security exploit, uh, you should first contact the owner behind the affected software. The hope there is that they say thank you, maybe give you some money in the form of a bug bounty, they fix the issue, and then you go public about the security exploit. In the case of Mario Kart Wii, since the servers were shut down over 10 years ago, oh my god I feel old. The next best thing is to contact MrBean35000VR and Chatters, the two administrators behind CTGP, and tell them what shenanigans I've been up to. After that, the next best step is to wait until it's fixed. And so that's why I've sat here for over a year. But in the past 14 months, I've been in constant communication with Mr. Bean and Chatters to make sure that this is properly patched in an adequate manner before I go public. I'll go into more detail about Bean and Chatters' fix for this later on in the video, but for now, just know that for CTGP, the threat of a replay device being used to submit fraudulent times to the leaderboards has been addressed. It's no longer a concern. Okay, with all of that out of the way, let's talk about how I made it. We want to somehow swap out a GameCube controller with a custom controller that can send a predetermined sequence of inputs down the wire to the console as if it was a regular GameCube controller. So we first have to figure out how exactly a GameCube controller talks with the Wii. First, take a look at each of the pins in the controller port. One is a 5 volt power supply for the controller rumble. One is 3.3 volt power for the rest of the hardware in the controller. Two of the pins are ground. And the last is the data line. What's that? 
Oh, this guy? He doesn't actually do anything for whatever reason, so we can just ignore it. For the purposes of this project, we don't care about controller rumble, so we can just ignore that. We also don't need to worry about power or ground, since the hardware I'll be using can be powered via USB and natively runs at 3.3 volts. This means all we have to worry about is the data wire. Nice and simple. The data wire is bi-directional, so data can go from the controller to the console and vice versa. Let's get a better idea of what's actually happening across this wire by talking through the three different stages that occur when you plug in a controller. The console wants to know what type of controller you are, such as a dance mat, a keyboard, or just a regular controller. So we'll send the corresponding zeros and ones for the regular controller. Then the console asks the controller for some calibration data to compensate for stick drift. Finally, we move to the fun part. The Wii will now repeatedly ask or poll the controller for inputs. Each time, the controller has to respond with data that represents the control stick positions and button presses at that moment in time. Easy enough, right? You ever had that class in school where the lecture makes sense, but you don't actually have any idea how to do the homework? That's kind of where we're at right now. We know that we need to send data down the wire, but how do you actually do that? To represent zeros and ones through a wire, we can change the voltage. For example, a full 3.3 volts could represent one, while zero volts could represent zero. But something this simple isn't quite good enough. If the console reads the voltage slightly off time, which does happen, then it might, for example, read a 1 when it should have read a 0. To combat this, the GameCube controller uses what's called the Joybus protocol to talk to the console. Each bit lasts 4 microseconds. A 0 is represented with 3 microseconds of low voltage followed by 1 microsecond of high. A 1 is represented with 1 microsecond of low followed by 3 microseconds of high. Notice how these are complete opposites of each other. Even if there's slight timing issues, the Wii knows that low is the start of that bit's transmission, and then it can just identify whichever voltage lasts longer. Next, we need to represent the state of the controller in terms of ones and zeros. The console expects the following 8-byte data structure every time it pulls the controller. In our first byte, we always have three leading zeros followed by ones or zeros to represent the start, Y, X, B, and A buttons being pressed. In the next byte, we have a leading 1, the shoulder buttons, Z, and the D-pad buttons. Then we have two bytes for the X and Y stick positions, two bytes for the C-stick X and Y positions, and two bytes for the shoulder button sliders. We can ignore a lot of this since for time trials, we only care about A to accelerate, B to break and drift, L to use items, the D-pad to wheelie and trick, and the analog stick to turn. Now that we understand what GameCube controller data looks like, how do we actually do all these precise voltage changes? We can use a microcontroller like the Raspberry Pi Pico. It's basically just a really tiny computer. The goal here is going to be to connect the GameCube controller's data wire to one of the pins on the Pico, plug the other end of the cable into the console, and run software on the Pico to take a ghost file's input data and send it across the data wire to the console. Okay. Enough blabbering about the theory behind all this, let's actually make it. I bought the Pico and once I unboxed it, I realized that it doesn't come with the header pins. If you want pre-soldered headers, you need to buy the Pico H instead. You may think that the most reasonable thing for me to do is return the Pico and buy the Pico H for a couple dollars more. From a young age, my mommy always told me that I was very special. And so that's why I bought a $50 soldering kit instead. At this point in the project, I didn't really plan out what all I was going to need to get this working, so I just assumed I'd need to solder something at some point. And spoiler alert, I didn't! Anyway, you got your spindle of solder and your iron. The iron heats up to around 650 degrees Fahrenheit, and at that temperature, we can melt the solder down and connect each port on the Pico to a header pin. Check out my first ever solder joint. Well, this is a good start, so the rest of my joints should be fine. Okay, maybe not, but I tested all of them. They work. This was good practice, at least, even though I literally didn't have to do this. 
Now we need to connect one of the pins to a GameCube controller's data wire. You could sacrifice a GameCube controller, but my therapist and I concluded that I couldn't bear that guilt, so I bought some extension cables instead. I cut off the socket, used an X-Acto knife to remove the cable shield, and then I used a wire stripper to cut off a little bit of insulation at the end of the data wire. To make sure I get a good connection with this wire, I also got a crimper and a 2.54 millimeter DuPont connector kit. I have some conductive metal housing, I slipped the wire through the housing, and crimped down on it. Now the housing is wrapped tightly around the wire. What we're left with is a cable whose one end can plug into the Pico, and whose other end can plug into the console. Let's hand this over to our QA team. I'll take that as a pass. So now, let's take a look at the software that we're going to put on the Pico. I made use of Arde's Pico Rectangle Repository, which enables you to make custom controllers for Super Smash Bros. Most importantly, it does a really good job of implementing the Joybus protocol and turning the controller state into the correct bits. I wrote some code that embeds a time trial ghost file inside the program. Then I have a class that's in charge of parsing out the input data for the next frame. It also compensates for the fact that the console actually pulls the controller more than once per frame. We can track what frame we're on by seeing how much time has passed since the controller was first plugged in. So let's start a race, plug the Pico in, and let's see what happens. It kinda looks like it's working. Oh, I think I plugged it in too early, so the inputs aren't happening on the right frame. To detect when the race is about to start, my plan is to point a camera at the monitor and have a Python script with some image processing to detect when the fade-in is- Wait, hold on! Do you see what I see? Because I see a 100% reliable way to tell when the race starts. If you start the race with the controller unplugged, this controller disconnected pop-up always happens on the same frame. And after you press A, it always takes the same number of frames to close. So we can write a little bit of code to press A on frame one so that the pop-up starts closing, wait 283 frames, and then start sending data from the ghost file. Doing so results in perfect timing every single time. Here's a few examples. What happened here? This is a multi-year callback to one of my previous videos. There are some inputs that are possible on the Wii wheel that are not possible with the GameCube controller. Mario Kart Wii restricts GameCube controller inputs to a unit circle before shipping them off to the physics engine and writing to the ghost file, which means certain diagonal inputs are not possible. Without some kind of cheat code to remove this restriction, we can only use this replay device to play back ghosts whose inputs are within the GameCube controller's input range. You could probably make a replay device that acts as a Wii remote. Then you're dealing with Bluetooth communication, and that sounds way too daunting for me to even consider trying. Let's talk about what this means for the community. The point that I'm trying to make with this project and video is that anybody could have done this. It's entirely possible that somebody already has made a replay device like this to submit inauthentic runs to the leaderboards. And the scary part is, we won't ever know if that's the case. So, we have to do something about this for the future. I first want to explain why I keep bringing up CTGP, even though I'm just talking about time trials and not custom tracks. Even though it just started as a custom track distribution pack, the introduction of client-side anti-cheat patches was really exciting for a community that's had several cheating scandals in the past. Due to how well Mr. Bean and Chatters have kept up with software patches over the years, it's generally agreed upon that if a time was set through CTGP, it's legitimate. So rather than worry about recording a hand cam video or live streaming all of your attempts, the majority of time trialers just run CTGP instead. 
While you can't detect hardware replay devices through software patches, you can do something to prevent them. Replay devices only work if the game's deterministic, meaning the same set of controller inputs produce the same result every time. And that's how time trials are. That's why every time you replay a ghost file in-game, it plays back the exact same way every time. I know there's a few of you nerds out there that are like, um, actually Malio, there are a few scenarios where ghosts desynchronize during time trials due to RNG that can happen. And that's a bug, and it's rare. I'm going to ignore you. The only way to prevent against a hardware replay device is to make your inputs non-deterministic. And oh boy, is that controversial! Here's how it works. Mario Kart Wii doesn't distinguish between all 256 possible values on each of the analog sticks' axes. Instead, what it does is it translates ranges of the stick's position to some number between 0 and 14. For the x-axis of the stick, this means that 0 is full left, 7 is neutral, and 14 is full right. It's pretty common that even if you immediately start drifting full left, your controller will end up getting pulled while it's moving. In this case, you might end up having something that looks like 7 on frame 1, 4 on frame 2, and 0 on frame 3 onward. But what if there was a slight chance that this gets changed to 730? Through blind trials, Bean and Chatters found that most people couldn't tell when their inputs were getting altered slightly. And thanks to the butterfly effect, you don't have to do this that many times before an input sequence will completely desynchronize a replay device beyond recovery. The plan right now, as I understand it, is to introduce six or so of these input changes in the first few seconds of the race. Doing it early on means that the butterfly effect will be in full force, and it won't affect an already stressful last lap. During very precise segments of ultra shortcuts, for example, it seems that a few top-level racers are able to tell when their inputs are being messed with. To avoid messing up critical moments like these, Bean and Chatters can define custom areas of tracks on a course-by-course -course basis, where inputs are guaranteed to never be altered. It's worth mentioning that they can continuously improve how this system works, too. It's not set in stone, so it can be tweaked over time as needed. In my opinion, there is no perfect solution. Other speedrun communities have had to prevent against cheating by requiring additional levels of proof. And even in scenarios where there appears to be enough proof, people can still slip through the cracks. <coughs> Dream! <coughs> what I'm trying to say is that the Mario Kart Wii community has long had the privilege of not requiring proof for time trials if you use CTGP. And if we want to keep it that way, then this system had to be implemented. I completely understand that even the idea of a hardware replay device has a negative effect on the community, but it's a reality. Someone else might have already done this, and there's no way of knowing. If you buy a Pico H with the pre-soldered headers and a GameCube extension cable and just tape the data wire to the header pin, then it costs less than $20 and an hour of your time to get this working. It's important for the community to recognize how easy it is to make a hardware replay device and that they should require a higher level of proof, whether that's through CTGP's new input fuzzing or by requiring live video when you set records. It's not for me to decide. I want to end with this. I started making TASSES about a decade ago because new time saves were found for the Coconut Mall Ultra shortcut, and the few TASSers at the time weren't working on those improvements. So I took the time to learn how to TASS, I made some on a few other tracks. They were bad, but I kept at it. Eventually I moved to TASSing Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. Eventually I had to learn how to write Lewis scripts and, and programs in order to make my TASSES better. And that's kind of how I found that my calling in life was computer science, so I got a degree in it, and I'm happy to say that that's still my hobby outside of work. I owe a lot to Mario Kart Wii and the people that I've interacted with over the past decade or so, because they're a huge reason that I've gotten to where I have in life, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. And yet, it's ironic that my love and appreciation for Mario Kart Wii is why I find myself causing so much commotion in the time trial community right now. I had a lot of fun working on this project, even if I finished it over a year ago. But I'm incredibly appreciative to Mr. Bean and Chatters for their constant communication to make sure that this inevitability was addressed. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good one.